All right, good morning. Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the department. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to a very, very special Grand Rounds, one that really is a highlight every year. We look forward to it and this one will be no exception. And I've seen the pictures from the dinner last night. So I know we're in for a big treat and a very special guest uh, this week. Um, and of course, we'll always start with our university land acknowledgement um, and then some of the um, opportunities for MOC and CME credit. Okay, um, and as you hear in a moment, uh, today we're going to hear from our Rudine uh, Marie DiCarlo lecturer, um, but looking ahead to special events, Bonnie Maldonado, our Chief of Pediatric Infectious Disease, is going to be uh, providing a COVID in Children's Seminar Series. This is a special Thursday seminar back in the throes of the pandemic. Bonnie and her colleagues did this for us almost every Thursday, it felt like, and we thought it was time for an update. Um, Bonnie also is getting ready for the Pediatric Academic Society meeting in a couple weeks where she's going to be the recipient of the Howland Award. And then another very special annual event, <laughs> excuse me, the following week is the Harvey J. Cohen, MD, PhD, Endowed Lectureship in Pediatrics. And this event is so special because every year we use this as an opportunity to celebrate one of our extraordinary young physician scientists on our faculty because Harvey has such a long and deep legacy of promoting physician scientists and our own Barrett will be speaking on mitochondrial dynamics, therapeutic target for multiple organ dysfunction syndrome in sepsis and beyond. And Barrett is an assistant professor in the Division of Critical Care Medicine. And make sure you know about our upcoming MCHRI seminar series. MCHRI, the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute, has a monthly seminar. And this is a great way to learn about maternal and child health research and opportunities across the entire campus. So I hope you are all MCHRI members and are getting those newsletters. And then, of course, we are gearing up for the annual Department of Pediatrics Research Retreat. So thrilled to be back together. We were together last year and this year. And really want to thank the program committee who put together a wonderful and really highly interactive program, as you can see here, with representation from our trainees to some of our most senior and distinguished faculty, but most importantly, breakout sessions, lots of opportunities to all come together. And so thank you to the program committee. It's uh, shaped up to be a really exciting day. And with that, I am going to welcome um, two people who are going to introduce this lectureship versus Marianne Karmick, who's was a pediatric resident, chief resident, and infectious disease fellow at Stanford, um, and now is at a retired after a career at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and Joan Fisher, who was a resident with Rudine Marie and is now a clinical professor of pediatrics in the division of hemonc and stem cell transplantation, practicing palliative care medicine embedded in the inpatient teams. And they, I know, had the great fortune of working with Rudine and will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Well, good morning everyone, and an especially good morning to uh, Rudine's mother, Carletta, who is listening to this lecture from home, as well as her stepmother, Maureen, and also to the many, many friends of Rudine who have supported this lectureship over the years. Um, in fact, the reason I'm wearing this somewhat wild jacket is uh, a nod to Carletta, who always loved to say that Rudine had more friends than zebras have stripes. And that was so true. Um, Joan and I are honored to have this opportunity to tell you uh, about Rudine Marie DiCarlo, the exceptional woman for whom this lectureship is named. Joan. Good morning. Um, we really think it's remarkable that after nearly 30 years from her death, those who knew Rudine continue to be inspired by her life and carry her lessons about patient care with them into our work. Some here were fortunate enough to know Rudine, but for those who did not, who was Rudine and why did she inspire such devotion to keeping her memory alive? To answer this, we should give you a bit of history. Rudine was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia when she donated blood just a few weeks before she graduated from Tulane Medical School. This was a time before the lovely tyrosine kinase inhibitors were on the market. And really, this was a death sentence for Rudine. Um, nevertheless, she started her internship and residency here at um, Stanford full of vim, vigor, and cheer, choosing not to burden her coworkers with her diagnosis. She wanted to achieve what she did on her own abilities with no special treatment. Initially, she told very few people of her illness. In fact, when she had her first bone marrow transplant during residency, very few people even knew that it happened. 
So what did they know? Uh, what they did know was that an amazingly bright and capable physician, as well as a total team player, was redeemed. Remarkably, she turned clinical rotations, she returned to clinical rotations after her bone marrow transplant. When it was apparent that the transplant had failed to cure her, she then courageously underwent a second transplant. Um, she was so determined to complete her training, she did so shortly before she succumbed to her disease. Her colleagues and friends and family started this lectureship and meet each year to remember Rudine and to perpetuate the lessons that she taught us about compassion for others during her own illness. We all have different stories about Rudine's impact on us. She was the consummate hostess in a sense. She was fun to be with and always made everyone around her feel comfortable and cared for. She would not expect others to feel sorry for her, often reciting her favorite quote from the Forrest Gump movie, life is like a box of chocolates because you never know what you're gonna get. We thought the best way to give a sense of why Rudine continues to inspire us and those who knew her would just to be sharing a couple of vignettes about uh, the sense of who Rudine was. So this is a story that illustrates Rudine's selfless compassion and was told to me recently by her attending when Rudine was an intern on the pulmonary service. In that era, patients with cystic fibrosis uh, were admitted to children's hospital long after they were adults, sometimes well into their 20s or 30s or even, even older. And this was not exactly the stuff of pediatrics. And many residents felt that, well, this wasn't really contributing to their training to become pediatricians. So one day the team learned that an adult patient that they knew well was being admitted. This person was much older than any of them and was famously irascible and uh, difficult. So no one wanted the assignment of taking the, doing the history and physical. So Rudine cheerfully volunteered. And when she presented her findings to her attending, her initial remarks were to the effect of, what a nice man and such an interesting case. And in the words of her attending, Rudine saw this opportunity, saw this as an opportunity to provide compassionate care to a very ill and fragile fellow human being, not as an annoying imposition. And you know, as powerful as this vignette is as an illustration of Rudine's grace and compassion, to me, it's remarkable that 30 years after this event, her attending still remembers it. And to me, that's a just remarkable testament to Rudine's supreme gift to us as a role model that lasted forever. Uh, I will never forget uh, Rudine shortly before she died. She uh, was in the hospital at Stanford for quite a long time. And she gave us several imperatives to live with. One day she asked me, why am I still here? How come I haven't died yet? It was just she and I. And I answered that perhaps her mission with us was not done. In response, she thought about the things that make a physician better from the perspective of a patient. She simply replied, very simple things really. Sit down when you talk to parents and patients. Wear a name tag and introduce yourself. Involve the patient in decision-making. Keep promises. Patients remember. Never underestimate the importance of touching your patients. And so we honor and remember Rudine for her gift to us, an enduring role model for compassion despite her own illness, while giving us a window into the world of being a patient. So with that, Ryan, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Carmack for reminding us all about um, Rudine Marie's legacy. And um, I'm so excited to now introduce our speaker for today. Um, I'm Ryan Leone, I'm one of the pediatric chief residents. Um, so uh, Dr. Edward Barksdale is surgeon in chief at Rainbow Baby and Children's in hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, and is a tireless advocate for children and their families. He's been described as a leader and a mentor who cultivates both excellence and creativity in providing holistic care for children and adolescents. 
an accomplished surgeon. He's the prior president of both the American Pediatric Surgery Association, as well as the Society for Black Academic Surgeons. He's nationally recognized for his work in management of short bowel syndrome and intestinal failure, as well as the immunobiology of neuroblastoma. Uh, throughout his career from Boston to Pittsburgh to Cleveland, Dr. Barksdale has consistently been engaged in advocacy efforts and community work, bringing concrete solutions to pediatric care. He's currently leading a hospital-based violence intervention program called the Anti-Fragility Initiative to support recovery of children and adolescents who are victims of violence, which we all know for anyone who's paid attention to the news is just so important now more than ever. Um, we are so incredibly grateful that he flew in uh, from Ohio again after visiting Stanford not too long ago to speak to our surgical colleagues. And we're so grateful that he was nominated by our residents, nominated by Tito Thomas, one of his former mentees and voted by our residents to be our speakers. So in Rudine Marie's honor, please join me in welcoming our Rudine Marie DiCarlo guest lecturer, Dr. Barksdale. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I would like to pause to say that for me, Rudine, is here. If she asks you why she's still here, I'm not sure she ever left. And in the world that I grew up in, I grew up as a Southerner. My great grandparents who were both were all formerly enslaved people. There was a saying that I grew up with that as long as you honor the ancestors and speak about them in personal ways, they never leave you in spirit. They just leave you in body. And so thank you for that description. Um, I got a lot to do in a little bit of time. And so I wanna make sure that I don't make you dizzy with all the slides I have. And I, I don't like burn you up with the energy that I'm gonna to try to uh, convey to you. Um, but I think everyone in this room who's in pediatrics embodies this ethos. And I think Rudine embodied this ethos. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Does that look like me now? So. <laughs> This uh, is uh, one of the pictures that I like that embodies to me the essence of childhood. Uh, I was fortunate. I had, did not grow up in an environment with any trauma that I realized in the home, certainly growing up in Lynchburg, Virginia, in the 1960s, in a family who were social activists, in a house that Martin Luther King walked into that front door. And I won't get into that story. That's for another, another time. I, I had a great childhood. And so uh, as we fly into the talk, I would though like to talk with you about the life that I live now. And my life has gone, my career life has gone through various iterations. I'm a paid consultant. But before I start, a few things that I want to honor uh, as I would honor uh, based upon my Southern heritage. For those of you, who celebrate Ramadan, I, I wish you a prosperous Ramadan. For those who may be online, uh, who it's Passover, happy Passover. I'm sorry, my Hebrew isn't good. I used to know how to say it in Hebrew. And for those who celebrate Good Friday, uh, happy Good Friday. This week for me has always been one of the best weeks of my life. And you will know from being in Roanoke, Virginia, although global warming has changed, that the first week of April is when the cherry, cherry blossoms bloom. And though I live in the sister city to Roanoke in Lynchburg, my father worked in Washington, D.C., and my mother and I would go stay with him. He would work during the weeks. And I just always, when I see the cherry blossoms, it brings me a sense of peace and calm. And uh, so it's, I'm happy to be here. I was concerned that I might not get here on time yesterday because when I got in my ark, uh, you know, I was here three weeks ago when there was more rain in, San, in the Bay Area than I'd ever seen ever. I, I, got, I started building an ark to get back here because I figured it'd take me a while. But I'm absolutely delighted to be here at Stanford again and to be here uh, with what I think are my peeps, pediatricians. I'm a pediatrician who operates. And so uh, <laughs> thank you for that opportunity. And I've been so impressed by your uh, department with the various things that you do in the realms of uh, health equity and social justice, which have been in the background of my life forever, even when I was trying to make cancer vaccines. Your Department of Health Equity, uh, I've kind of great work. Um, I've been uh, on your website and trying to learn so much about you. But I bring you the greetings from my current home city, Cleveland, Ohio. 
<laughs> but you're from here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the base of our hospital system, University of Hospitals, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. And um, I think my thunder was stolen a little bit. I always like to do land acknowledgements. And so um, I'll just say mine briefly. It is with sincere gratitude and humility that I pause to honor the Mwekma Ohlone people who inhabited this region. And I do this not out of any form of, uh, of political or popularity reasons, but it's to honor their grace and their impact on our shared or collective humanity. And as we heard about Rudine, the, the words that emerged to me were the words of, uh, of, of the H's, uh, humor, humility, humanity, and hope. And what I feel the core of pediatrics is, is that you, me, we are purveyors of hope. And it is that that allows us to get through the chaos that gets us from the craziness to some sense of order that empowers people. Um, and when I think about Rudine as a teacher and a mentor, I have often found that some of my greatest teachers were not the people who I thought were vertically above me, they were the people beside me or the people who saw me as their superior. And I, I, I believe strongly that what great teachers do and what Rudine did is she helped change how those around her thought. And uh, one of the people who happened to be one of my medical students uh, when I was at, at uh, the Mass General during my training, he was a third year Harvard medical student. And for two weeks, every other night, uh, every other day, we spent 24 hours together. And uh, some of you may know him differently. Um, you may know him by his books. I know him by character, but I lost him a year ago. And Paul Farmer is someone who had tremendous impact on me personally in a little bit different way than he may have on you. We used to get into arguments about whether it was global or whether it was local, which means was it Haiti or was it East Palo Alto? But nevertheless, there he is with uh, two of my best friends, my best friend who's the Dean of the medical school at Miami, but uh, this was a few years ago uh, when my friend was president of the American Pediatric Surgery Association. But what I learned from Paul uh, in 2006, when I was at a point, a pivot point in my career, moving from being a scientist to moving to be more of a leader, uh, Paul really encouraged me to stop thinking at the micro level and to begin thinking at the bio-social level to have impact, because what it's all about is impact. And so um, I'd like to talk to you, uh, the topic is from chaos to community. So I have an ambitious objective, but I want to do, first thing that I want to do is I want to inform you. The second thing I want to do is I hope is to inspire you. And the third thing that I hope to do is to galvanize you, to collaborate, to think creatively, about the things that you can do that will have a much broader impact on uh, child health. It's been a crazy three years, right? Between the virus, the financial markets, and you guys are like making it worse here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the social reckoning or racial reckoning that we've had, the great uh, recession with women leaving the marketplace, and then the political upheaval in our country. This has brought us to a time in which I think that we're in an intense degree of chaos and disorder within our country. And it's resulted in our recognition of the significant health disparities and health inequalities that exist in our country. I've often had a hard time understanding what health disparity was. And I'm a person who thinks in terms of pictures, and although we see the difference here, we don't always fully recognize those disparities unless they're called out to us. Now, you guys know these things from your reading, the differences that were exposed during the pandemic, and uh, uh, these definitions for health disparities, the unequal burden. But I think the disparity that we, ex we see and the disparity exposed by the pandemic goes so much deeper. When I was learning about your area, I admit, I'm a person that thought that, you know, this was all dot-com millionaires here. I mean, I, I think that's the East Coast image, uh, that this is an area that thrives. And uh, I think of it as an area where there, um, it, it, there is significant diversity. But when I looked at uh, some of the data here, 
there's significant life discrepancies between East Palo Alto, the county, and then some of the other communities, there can be up to almost a 25 year age disparity. And so I was excited to come to Stanford again and to come to Stanford to speak to pediatricians because I believe strongly, I've always, uh, not always, maybe since 1980 when I started medical school and all the darn Stanford people told me that they were leaving the best and the brightest to come to the Harvard people so that they could elevate this. So I've come to elevate them. So I've come to realize and acquiesce to my Bay Area friends that you are the best and you are the brightest. And I'm hoping that you will also be the boldest. And that is probably more important than being best or bright, that you will be the people who look to make change. So uh, when we look at the average life expectancy that exists here, you see the numbers. And um, I think, and the experts think that life expectancy is an important way of evaluating health. Uh, these things, you know, I won't go through these numbers. You can see these online. These are in the East Palo Alto general plan to eliminate disparities, but I was shocked. And one of these that shocks me is I thought there were a ton of jobs here. And I didn't realize that there's a job loss. There's a ton of jobs for people who are creative, uh, but there are people being pushed out of the region and being displaced. And so again, I think these are opportunities for us to have impact. And, and what this shows is it shows, um, the shortage of physicians. And so there's a lot clustered in the areas of wealth and academia, but uh, not elsewhere. Well, God, sorry, this is advancing ahead of me it's to make me move forward. But I recognize when I see those numbers about the housing issues that just like everywhere else in the country, health and wealth go together. I think those are opportunities. Well, an incredible article came out a week ago today, in my opinion, from the Financial Times, and I would encourage many of you to look at this article. It's a follow-up on this concept of deaths of despair, which for me, and hopefully not in a racist fashion, has been something that's made me anxious since I read the book by the two Princeton experts, which really talks about um, that American life expectancy is going down, and particularly going down in white males uh, between the ages of about 40 and 65. And living in Ohio, I see this population. During the last, uh, well, even up to the present, the number of drug overdoses that were occurring uh, from here are out of control. And again, as a kid who in the 1970s, in 1972 in my neighborhood, heroin hit my neighborhood, and we lost people and it changed my whole behavior patterns. Um, I didn't realize that white people did heroin. And I, and you're, you're laughing, but you were in Roanoke, but at the time, and that was always portrayed as a problem of, of the urban neighborhoods. And now, you know, in Ohio, there's a tremendous loss and this deaths of despair um, is incredible. And what's missing from this slide is that one in 25, five-year-old Americans will die before the age of 40. And you can see the curves here. And in fact, in this article, which I recommend, the life expectancy in the entire United States is worse than the worst city in all of England, Blackpool, which is a, a place on the shore. And so again, uh, we, as pediatricians, people taking care of children, I think have an opportunity uh, we have a mandate to think in terms of moving from chaos to community. And this is the book by the two professors from Princeton outlining what's happening in middle America, the white males, but we are also seeing deaths of despair in the urban community. I would argue that gun violence, different from suicide, alcohol, IV drug abuse, but the gun violence that we see, that I see in the streets of Cleveland, are deaths of despair. When people have no hope, there's no way of controlling their behavior. And so when they are in despair, they may hurt themselves or they may hurt others. And we're now beginning to see a rise in suicide rates. So the first thing I wanna leave you with is that the health disparities that we see in many communities, whether it is 
communities of color or whether it's working class communities in the Midwest. Uh, the disparities that we see relative to the major populations are, in my opinion, the result of despair. And getting back to this concept that as pediatricians, we must begin, we must train families, and we must look for avenues to be purveyors of hope. Um, you guys are well educated on this. I should have taken all the stuff out, looking at the great work you're doing in health equity. So you guys can teach me about health equity. And I'm sure you're all really fond of this. Yes, is this how you see health equity? Does everyone see health equity? Come on. Yes? Yeah. What's that? Well, I don't see it that way. So, um, and I don't even call the last health equity. I call it health justice. And so that, that what exists in the middle panel to me is structural violence. Those are the barriers that encumber people on one side of the fence from getting access to, if you will, the American dream or getting access to the quality of care that they should have. And so for the best and the brightest and the boldest and the routine the Carloist among you, I would challenge you to think in terms of health justice. Again, it was a friend of mine who I've mentioned already who helped introduce me to this concept of structural violence, which I'll talk about briefly. You probably know Johann Galton, who was a theologian, a Swedish uh, theologian, who in 1969 um, described this con concept of violence, structural violence. And it was novel and not picked up very much at the time. Most of us think about the other forms of, of violence, direct violence or cultural violence. But as you can see that's described here is cultural violence is that type of violence deeply embedded in structures and systems. The so-called isms, ages, ageism, disabilityism, racism, sexism, uh, genderism, all of those things are the things that act and are embedded in our economic and political structures that conspire to constrain people from getting access to the things that they need in order to, to achieve and to do well. So uh, Paul Farmer wrote a lot about this. And so I think it is our responsibility uh, to address these. And I would ask you rhetorically, do physicians have social responsibility in this realm, or better yet. Do pediatricians have responsibility? Now, I know this often asks people to step outside of their comfort zone, but I think that there are numerous opportunities for us to think about how we can be advocates, how we can assume some level of responsibility. It's not really a new concept, Rudy Verkow, in the mid 1800s, uh, talked about physicians being uh, the natural. I, I really have to change this because attorneys still rub me a little wrong. I, I should just change this to advocates of the poor, <laughs> but but he argued that we are the natural uh, attorneys of the poor. And I think that over time, as we've become more focused on the molecular level or less, that we are moving away from from this mandate. I won't even talk about the definition of advocacy after looking at your website. You guys know what advocacy is. It's a variety of things. But I'd like to call your attention to how I see advocacy. Uh, I see advocacy based a lot on, on an area of seeing, thinking of activism. So I grew up very simply. I grew up in a small city in the South in the 1960s in what's called the post-Jim Crow era. And uh, my mother was a seamstress in a sock factory. Uh, she never graduated high school. She never, she finished the 10th grade. My father was a glorified postman. And uh, they wanted a life better for their children, like the American dream than either of them had. And so in 1961, they began a lawsuit. They sued the public school system in my city to integrate the school system. Um, and they were with a group of four other, five other families. They lost the case, four families dismissed. This was only the second case in the history of Virginia. 
And for those of you who are young, this probably makes no sense, but it was a really big deal. Um, and uh, it was really a big deal because there were people who had to guard our house. Um, uh, FBI people stayed in the yard, people threatened to blow our house, burn our crosses on our yard lawn. And then the next year, they won the case on appeal. And going through this entire process and watching my parents as a child uh, work to advocate for what they felt was the right thing to do was important. And uh, to cut the story, you know, this was a time when Martin Luther King actually came to our small house to encourage my parents to keep the fight going. And they weren't fighting in their, their mind. And I always remember as a child or when I was older, I asked my father why he put our whole family uh, through this entire process. And he would say to me that as he was a musician, a jazz musician, he said, um, the melody was hope. The instrument was justice. And so it was that concept of justice that I grew up with that I can't get out of me. And so for me, an advocate is also an, an activist. And an advocate activist is also an ally. And an advocate activist and ally is also a leader. And so I am challenging you, the best and the brightest, to think in terms of leadership. But this is the paradigm of advocacy that I think about, that I teach about. It consists of these components. There are the things that you can do at uh, the four domains. For me, are things you can do at the local level to strengthen uh, individuals. Those are things that you're doing now in your clinics and your activities. There are things that you can do to strengthen communities. And I love seeing the things that you guys are so nicely cultivating. But there are a couple other levels that I'd like to challenge you to think about is, is really getting involved in improving the living conditions that are in EPA or wherever you go. And you may say that's you know like boiling the ocean. No, you can boil the ocean. You just take a little pot and you put some ocean water in it and put it on your stove. And if everybody does that, the temperature changes. Look, what, look what's happening with global warming. We're seeing glaciers now. So something is boiling the ocean. And then the fourth domain is uh, to look at macro policies, to do things at, at a, a much different level. So again, the best, the brightest, and the boldest. I'd like to ask you, one, what is your identity? Can you do more? And can you be more uh, in, in your current role, whether it's retired physician, whether it's mid-career professional, whether it's resident, or whether it's any of you who don't even wanna be here, who's just kind of checking off the box, but think about, <laughs> can, you, can you go beyond your comfort zone to be more? Keep getting back to what our enduring responsibilities are as pediatricians or pediatricians who operate. So I asked myself this question uh, after having my favorite adult beverage with Dr. Farmer, um, when I was trying to decide whether I was gonna reestablish my lab, because I'd lost funding, or whether, whether I was gonna reestablish my identity when I moved to Cleveland in 2007. And so I'd like to pivot now in my talk to talk to you a little bit about my work. And so my father would say, the job is where you get paid, work is where you add value. And I'm hoping that this is where I'm adding value to the current community. You must be living under a rock if you don't realize that we are in a crazy chaotic time from the realm of gun violence, not just in our greater community, but also for children. And my talk is not pro-gun, anti-gun, it's just uh, talking about what we're seeing. And just in 2020, I haven't updated this slide, we saw a 47% increase nationally in Cleveland. We saw a 47% increase in gun violence in 2021 and a similar increase in 2022. And although these episodes get a lot of the attention and they are heinous, we're seeing a much worse epidemic in many of our streets. I just spoke with a good colleague of mine who's this year's president of APSA and her CEO, who's one of my mentors, um, 
that at Children's Hospital, um, it used to be Memorial, but the, or Weiler's, the Children's Hospital of the University of Chicago, that they saw 267 uh, gunshot wounds in children last year. We think we see a lot in Cleveland. We see 70. And uh, 11 of their 19 ICU beds were filled with patients who have been uh, shot children. And so I, I just never imagined that we'd be in that position. And I was offended by the thought of, of myself ever working in this space. It just seems, uh, if you will, it seemed too dirty. I, and I don't say that in a pejorative way, but um, it's, it's got too many variables. It's not like something that you can control in the lab. But, but what my mentor, her name is Pat Donahoe, my scientific mentor, would always tell me uh, and she's the first woman in the National Academies of Science who's a surgeon, she's got a ton of credentials. She said, Ed, always follow the science. And I thought that meant follow the basic science. But when I got to Cleveland, I began to follow the social science. And so we're in a pandemic. That's when two or more pandemics exist. And I think at the core of the second pandemic, that's the violent one, is despair uh, in addition to the virus. So what happened to me when I went to Cleveland? 2007, small town boy, Lynchburg, Virginia, gets to be uh, chief of surgery at a major children's hospital, a lifetime dream. This is what happened the day of my dream. My dream was shattered by a gunshot wound. The very first patient that I took care of was a 14-year-old kid who looked like my 15-year-old kid who looked like my 14-year-old son. Um, he was going to play a video game, and there's a thing in Cleveland, some neighborhoods, you have to have something called a hood pass, and a hood pass means that if they don't know you in that hood, then you're fair game. And so then I learned a lot about my new city, different from my old city of Pittsburgh, but you'll see all the things there. Seventh highest crime rate in the country, two of the 25 most dangerous neighborhoods, including the second most dangerous neighborhood in the country. During my time, first time that homicide was the leading cause of death, uh, that was 2012, highest infant mortality rate in the United States, um, highest suicide rate in the school system. This is a city uh, that suffers under the weight of the social determinants of health. And this is this patient who I took care of, whose mother told me that I can use his picture forever. Um, it always makes me sad when I see him such lost potential. And it wasn't until two years ago that his mother took down the blue ribbon. She kept thinking he was gonna walk in the door one day. So as the scientist, academic surgeon that I thought I was, I kept trying to tightrope my way away from this morass of all these social issues toward academic medicine. And lo and behold, uh, they kept pulling me in. And as a result of being pulled into this morass, I took a note from the page of my new friend. I got to meet him and got to have him speak on my behalf last year, Brian Stevenson. I wanted to get proximate to the problem. I wanted to get close to the problem. So many times that I have done that, I've done that without my wife knowing. Um, and why, what I mean by that is I've been no longer in some crazy places, crack houses, shooting dens with uh, police, but sometimes, but not always, try to get to understand the people, many of whom look like me 40 years ago, what brings them to this level of disparity and how might I work with others to craft a solution to not just advocate for them, not just be an activist for them, but to boldly create something from an entrepreneurial standpoint that might help them. These things, you know, I realize in Cleveland, like every city, geography is destiny. If you look at where people live, kids die uh, where they're poor. And two of the best healthcare systems in the United States, uh, Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, there's an area where it said it's the best place in the world to have a TIA or chest pain because you are in the middle of two great cardiovascular places. That neighborhood, 44103, has a life expectancy of 64 years and the highest infant mortality rate in the neighborhoods in the United States. So it's, it's weird, the chasm that exists uh, in that area. And 
six miles away in Lenhurst, beautiful tree-lined streets, life expectancy 88.4 years. And here you see the kids. This is a typical kid born uh, eight, um, um, born in Huff, which is where the clinic and UHR, and a child born miles away. Social determinants of health, I think. So geography is destiny, and I'm, this slide I'll take out. So what I did when I had this young, young boy is I was very upset. I went to the president of the hospital, and I said, um, Mr. Farrell, what are you doing about this problem? And he looked at me the way every leader should. And he said to me, what are you doing about the problem? And so uh, that was, I guess, apocryphal for me. I, so I left the office and I came back and asked him, I want to meet with the mayor. I want to meet with the chief of police. And uh, he set up that meeting. We developed the program Operation Focus. Uh, and you can see the description here. We brought in all these gangbangers. We went on the streets. Uh, we brought mothers of kids who had been shot. We brought men who had been in prison, who had raped young men in prison and told them what they do to these these kids, and we tried to scare them straight. And lo and behold, that level of advocacy and activism worked. We had the lowest murder rate in the history of Cleveland uh, with our program. And we parlayed that into a $2 million grant uh, from the feds. And in fact, Eric Holder came to pat us on the back. There I am with Eric Holder, the attorney general, and Steve Dettelbach, who's now the uh, head of ATF. And we were all excited, defending childhood. We were going to do these things. And lo and behold, when the money ran out, the murder rate went higher than it had ever been. So our strategy may have been temporarily successful for those of you who are advocates, but not sustainable. And so what I'd learned from all the time that I had gone into the inner city and into the crack dens and hung out on the corners and the kids said I looked like them, but I wasn't like them, as they said to me, not all skin folk or kin folk. They start telling me about life. And what they said for life was for them is living in fear every day. And most of the young men didn't think they'd get to the age of 25. And I recognized that for many of the young boys and girls that I saw, that there was no, no childhood. And that childhood was blurry. And that the boundaries between them and others were often confused such that they didn't see futures that were viable for them. And others didn't see them as viable in the future of the city. And by the time many of them got to the recovery room, the emergency room, the operating room, uh, they had really tumbled down the social, societal uh, hurdles that uh, uh, encumbered them. And I learned that I wasn't really a trauma surgeon, that I was a surgeon who took care of victims of violence. And that what trauma was, was an event and an experience and its effects. I learned that trauma was different than what I had been taught my entire career as a surgeon and that its impact that it had on people um, was significant. And, and many of the kids I saw in the hospital had seen and witnessed things that this kind of naive boy growing up in Lynchburg, Virginia, couldn't imagine in his home, although it happened in homes in Lynchburg. Uh, but it created this repetitive cycle of violence that happened when they were young, that played itself out on the streets. And not only did it play itself out on the streets, as my um, professor in medical school or assistant professor, Bessel van der Kolk, talked about, it also played itself in their body and their physiology. And you recognize, uh, and I've used these slides often when I'm speaking to surgeons or people in the public, that again, um, trauma etches deep wounds in the psyche of, of children and that we have to understand that. You guys know about Felidi Ananda and the ACEs, so I won't go through this, I'll just go through this quickly, but if you got more ACEs, it's not good for your health. And uh, it increases your risk for a variety of pathologic things. So I'll just talk about this briefly in the program that we have. So I wanted to go deep and understand the roots of violence. And I felt I could not be an advocate, an activist, an ally, or a leader unless I understood something outside of what I read. I needed to experience it directly. And so working in the community, 
creating collaboratives uh, allowed me to look at the root conditions and to understand who the experts were. And I often see myself in the role of advocacy as a busy, busy clinical surgeon, as, as being kind of a conductor of an orchestra in which I'm not that talented. And um, for those of you who know any African-American gospel music, there is a guy by the name of Kirk Franklin. And Kirk Franklin's won a ton of, of uh, Grammy Awards, uh, but he can't think. <laughs> and all he does is he walks around and he goes, oh, uh, uh. Let me, and, and so I sometimes feel like the Kirk Franklin of, of advocacy. I just walk around and go, mm, 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 and other people uh, like Tito, you know, Thomas, other people do things that make it look like I, I am, am doing it. So uh, an, a way to do this is a way to kind of be a convener is what I'm saying. And forgive the humor, but sometimes the humor breaks up the very serious nature that a surgeon can be. And so when I looked at the neighborhoods, these are red line maps. You understand red line maps. I have some beautiful work that a student has done for us. But basically, the kids in Cleveland die in the red line neighborhoods, especially from violence. They don't die anywhere else except in the very affluent neighborhood that's here, Strongsville. They die from gun violence. They shoot them. And so I think it's the same issue as bear. I'm sorry, this got slipped in. and and. Uh, so I had an important event in my life the last week of uh, September, first week of October of 2015. I, uh, there were four kids who came in, uh, shot, killed under the age of 10. And if any of you listen to the serial podcast, you'll know about this angel and the right that I took care of. It really changed what I was going to do. I moved from this concept of advocacy, of kind of working in the community and working, wanting to create a, pro a program. So we did research on the kids that were coming in. And I'm going to go through this because my time is short. Um, we looked at violent injuries that came into our emergency room, not just gunshot, but all forms of violence. And what we found is that for our gunshot wound victims, between the ages of 6 and 15, 30% recidivism rate or re-injury rate from guns. I couldn't imagine that. A seven-year-old getting shot three times. How, does the, how do they get shot once? And how are they put in harm's way? Um, the thing that I've taken out of this is that 30% also will come back with a suicide attempt or major depressive episode. And so we see that uh, this is having great impact. So we decided we'd collaborate with our colleagues at Case Western Reserve University, the School of Urban Poverty, the Mandel School. They have one of six major longitudinal databases that captures uh, now about 700,000 children and 3 million, 300 million, I'm sorry, 275 million records. So if you were born in Cuyahoga County, in any time since 1989, they will have all the things that are important across these domains. And it is well organized. And so we can query that domain. So we got the bright idea. Tito Thomas got the bright idea. Um, and we met with them and we decided to look at our injury victims. I think when I was cutting out some slides, I moved something out, but we collaborated with them. This is the the, uh, the work that shows 30%. And what we did is, and you can see this, the paper, I'm just gonna summarize the paper. I have some more details here, but it's an administrative database. We looked at the records of the categories of kids who were shot and the kids who were attacked, physically attacked. And we compared them with age matched controls. So 22,000, age match controls from the same neighborhoods with these 450 kids. And if you look at them, so 452 kids, all but five, all but five were, uh, all, all but uh, 20 were in our registry. And we looked at the differences between the groups, comparing a wide variety of things, like when their mother got pregnant, with them, were they premature? Did they miss primary care visits? And in essence, what we found, and I'm sorry that this is probably the real meat and we're rushing through this, but the important thing that we found is that they were more likely to be premature. Uh, they were more likely to require um, uh, public assistance uh, and be in the child welfare system. 
they had housing insecurity. They were more likely to be homeless. And uh, education, absence from school was, was very high. And so what we felt, and you'll see this in the paper, and, and I, I don't like saying this uh, too much because if it's out of context, there's a whole concept in science of the mother licking the, the rats that are called the mother licking rat, the rat who lick their babies more. Uh, you know, but we found that we felt that there was an issue with early maternal nurturing and care in our kids who are a higher incidence. And so the, that's not a problem, that's an opportunity that we need better training to train mothers or to put uh, many teen mothers, the average age of 16, in a better position to provide for their child or maybe to defer that a few years in which they're more mature. And so the surgery concept of trauma of treatment and treatment was not right. And that we concluded that we needed to create an ecosystem of care around our children. And that is the concept for me of community. So as I move quickly uh, to this, so I'll, I'll tell you what we, what we did and what we built. Um, I think I'm a frustrated anthropologist. Um, I didn't think I could get into medical school if I majored in that soft stuff. So biology was good. But I always liked uh, Margaret Mead. And you'll know that Margaret Mead was asked one day, what's the earliest sign of civilization? And so she said, a healed, broken femur. That doesn't make any sense to me, a healed, broken femur. Well, it's written there for you, but I'll tell you what it says. Uh, she basically told this student that what it meant is that someone had to stay with that person and care for them until they were able to get on their own. So an animal wouldn't attack them. And so they wouldn't starve uh, or someone else would injure them. And so it reminded me of what my grandmother told me as a kid. My grandmother, born in 1886, first black social worker in our part of Virginia. And for some reason, she never explained to me why she was fluent in German and spoke French. And I figured out because of my middle name that the people who probably owned her parents were Alsatian and so, but she brought, introduced this word to me and this concept of being broken and healed of an accompanitur or someone who goes along with. And in many ways in pediatrics and in social justice, we need to be accompanitur's. And so I decided, that I was gonna focus not on the vector, the gun, but on the victim and develop a program that would be a program of an accompanitur. Um, so we developed this program um, called the Anti-Fragility Initiative. And it was built on the fact that we're all broken, uh, but we uh, can be made strong. And that when I looked at the kids I'd seen in the street who had been injured and that I came to understand that hurt people hurt people. And as a trauma surgeon, once I got my arms around the fact of understanding that these people were injured, then I could approach them from the standpoint of healing. And so if hurt people hurt people, and we change the way we look at violence and see it from a health perspective, then those of you who are healers will understand this, that healed people heal people. And so um, I wanted to move from all the downstream stuff we've been doing to, up to getting upstream so that I could create a program and then affect policy. I looked at all of the moleskins. I am fanatic about taking notes and carrying things. I looked at the moleskins from all of my community experiences, following the science, and I wanted to develop a human-centered program uh, using human-centered design principles. Using my empathy, I went to define the problem, take the data, create an IDA prototype and test. The person who worked with me on this was Tito Thomas. And we developed this program called the Anti-Fragility Initiative. Um, Tito heard me speak in Los Angeles in 2013. And then when he came to Case, knocks on my door and some strange kid asked me if he can work with me. And I said, sure. And then that was $3.2 million later. So we developed this program built on the concept of Nassim Tlaib, which says that, um, things that are fragile and break can't be put back together. Things that are robust 
can't be broken. And the things that are anti-fragile, like DNA, break and can, when they are put together, uh, they can be stronger. As a kid who always wanted to mess with ceramics and do pottery, this related to this love I had of this kintsugi artwork. And you know the Japanese kintsugi art is a, a ceramic bowl was broken. Uh, the shogun couldn't get it fixed in the fifth century and someone used liquid gold to put it together and it became more valuable and more beautiful after being put together. So this is our program. I, we thought we could do that with kids who had been injured and broke. These are the principles of our program, new possibilities, increased strength, more meaningful relationships, greater appreciation and spiritual development. That's post-traumatic growth. These are our core values. It's a community-based program. Uh, these are our specific objectives. And uh, we, we conduct the program in the following way. We meet kids in the emergency room uh, after they've been injured. Uh, we develop a care plan for them. Within 24 to 48 hours, we're in their home and we carry this on over the course of a year. And uh, we believe strongly that this, that healthcare occurs in the hospital and health occurs in the community. And we collaborate with the police, a variety of other uh, agencies to provide holistic care for them. And uh, we have been funded through the governor. Um, the governor, far right wing conservative, when I first saw him, uh, did not want to talk to me at all about this, told me he had no more time to speak with me. Um, and he never heard it. And then I kept talking and he called the security people. I kept talking. And then 45 minutes later, he said, I don't have any more time, but can I call you? And he, in the call to me, he said, if you put this on paper, we'll fund it. It's the best social service program I've seen. And uh, it's history. And it's, well, that isn't, I mean, I, I, this is whenever one person talks about something, it's usually through collaboration with, with others. And so uh, it's an evidence-based program. This is our timeline and I'm sorry I ran over, uh, but uh, again, what we've mentioned is that we have, uh, I can't say eat more Panda Express, but Panda Express uh, supports us, uh, but this was our timeline. These are the things that we do. And we have another, uh, the mayor of Cleveland put a $1 million line item in for our program. And so uh, that's uh, the story. And we've developed a program to train medical students and our staff for trauma-informed care. We got invited to the White House by the president this past summer. Uh, to talk about the program. And so I want to close by telling you that this is the Greek god Kairos. And uh, if you know about Kairos, Kairos has this kind of no hair, this kind of tail there, and he has wings on his feet, and he's very fleeting. He's hard to catch. But I would tell you the best, the brightest, and the boldest are that Kairos. It's not all the energy of the moment to make meaningful change. I hate this quote. It takes a village to run. But why did I include it? Because I hate it. Who builds the village? And so that's what our responsibility is as purveyors of hope is to build the village. You can read more about our program. This came out in Children's Hospital Association art, uh, article this past week that summarizes uh, some of the things we've talked about in advocacy, developing community partnership, ensuring equitable care, make research investments, and create intervention programs. And I'll just leave this here to tell you the various steps that, that you can achieve moving forward as budding advocates. Um, these are the things that I think are really important. And I'd like to thank someone who is not here, who's with my wife there. And uh, I'd like to bid you both Ubuntu, which is I am because you are the South African concept, as you know. And I'd like to tell you thank you. And please reach out to me uh, if you have any questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Barksdale, so much. We acknowledge we're, we're on time or at time. So if folks need to slip out, they're welcome to. But we'll take a couple questions. Thank you so much. Okay. What a gift this talk was. Um, 
Wondering if you could speak a little bit about the policy impact you've had, um, if you've been working um, either with your city council, your school boards, your state representatives, and, and yeah, how do you transition from the academic setting to a policy setting? So uh, we've done all those. So our, our primary work has been with the mayor's office. We started in the mayor's office. And so it grew from the mayor's office and then went to the Department of Justice. And so that's been our big focus. And as a result of the funding, Jared Brown, who's the senator uh, for U.S. senator, has been very warm. And so we have focused in the first four years of the program of trying to do as many talks um, to try to tweet in order to get the attention of many people. You know, I think what happens, I call it getting skinny. Sometimes you try to do too much at once and try to have too much impact at once. You have to find that lane where you have expertise in and then go forward. I am not like you. I don't have formal training in advocacy. I don't have an MPH, but I know my own clinical experience. And so I, I have used that in order to gather data and to use the scientific principles and to try to make an argument that helps people understand the problem. Unfortunately, um, society is making it easier for me to explain. So, you know, the recent changes in, in you know, the publication of the New England Journal, as well as the mass shootings have resulted in people asking me to speak, asking my opinion. And so what I say to people who are interested in advocacy is try to find your skinny area of expertise and go deep. And much as any scientist does, make it evidence-based, get your data, and just keep pushing forward. What we haven't done enough of is publishing to our colleagues because my focus, our focus, and I'll say this, my focus, my focus is getting the money for the people in our group who are doing the work. And so, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I think I can ask one on Zoom. So uh, I think Dr. Axarog was asking uh, about the collaboration with police, especially, um, you know, it, uh, tell us a little bit about your approach to collaborating with the police, especially in the context of uh, challenges some of the patients may have had feeling unfairly right. targeted by law enforcement. So that has often been delicate. And so what we've tried to do is to bring uh, the two together. And what I've done with collaborating with the police is understand their concerns. I think this is a very tough time to be a police officer because there are people, and I know this will be politically incorrect of sorts, there are dangerous people in, in the streets. And so the police, I think at times are on the edge and they're asked to react in a split second and that may be the wrong decision. So one, uh, much of what we've tried to do is to bring the police together with the community. That's been challenging. The former chief of police we worked with, who we had a good relationship, retired. There was an interim chief of police and then a new mayor who kind of fired that police. So there's been lots of volatility and a lot of people leaving the police department. And I recognize that um, I am in a very distinct minority, even within the minority community uh, of policemen. So I'm perceived as educated, egghead, I don't understand what it's like. And so I try to approach the kids, the police, the public officials from a place of humility. And so what I would say that trying to seek first to understand and then be understood has been a key strategy and consistency. So I've done this for 16 years. In the beginning, no one gave me any attention, but they kept seeing me over and over again. So then they started calling me because they felt I was genuine. You have to build cachet. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Our house staff will have a chance to ask more questions later in the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Barksdale. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.